Amy and I met in August of 1995. I had just completed a year of research fellowship after my second year of medical school. And Amy had just come to Penn as a PhD student after having finished her bachelor's degree at Penn State University. She was working in the lab down the hall from me and this young lady just walked by me and, and I'm like, who is that? She was absolutely stunning. You know, our relationship was a testament really to my persistence, frankly, because I was a little bit on the amateur side, but I persevered and succeeded. And we ended up together for the next six years. And then 2001, we were married at the Philadelphia College of Physicians. Amy and I did pretty much everything together. We did research together, we published papers together, we spent a significant amount of time together in the operating room. We both had very high ideals. We were going to create an empire based on academic medicine. You know, in the end, it was a marriage that was based on surrender and loyalty to one another. And she was aware that she had a fibroid. Many women have fibroids. It's somewhere around 60 to 70 percent of women have these tumors inside the uterus, the vast majority of which end up being benign. And with every pregnancy, she was evaluated and ultrasounds were done. And this particular fibroid was present. It would increase in size as the pregnancy progressed and as she would deliver, the size of the fibroid would regress. With our sixth child, Ryan, the story was different. It was a pretty uncomplicated delivery. The problem was that over the course of the subsequent year, the fibroid this time did not regress in size. Her obstetrician expressed some concern about cancer. And I shot out an email to a gynecological oncologist requesting that he evaluate my wife. He basically evaluated her and totally reassured her that this is how fibroids behave. He believed that this was clearly a benign process. So then she was referred to a gynecologist by the name of Dr. Karen Wong. She basically just told her that she would be doing a minimally invasive operation and that the risks are the standard risks of bleeding and infection and bowel perforation. Now, at that point, there was no discussion of how she was going to take the tumor out, anything like that. And so we proceeded with the operation. I mean, it took two hours. Karen said the operation went very well. Amy came out. She recovered pretty well. She was up on her feet about 24 hours later. I was doing an operation on the morning of the 25th, and my phone basically just started to explode. And it was Amy who was very upset on the phone. She said she just got a call from Karen Wong, who basically told her that the pathology came back, and it's a leiomyosarcoma. And as a thoracic surgeon, I know what leiomyosarcomas are, and I also knew that the only chance of containing the process is to resect the tumor. So I immediately called Karen, and I asked her, just tell me that you got this damn thing as one mass. And at that point is the first time that she actually mentioned to me that, no, I had to morselate it to size to be able to get it through the vaginal canal. So what she'd done was she basically shaved off the tumor. I knew about morselation. And by the time I was training, it was completely out of practice because it caused problems and the problems had to do with the tissue, the bits and pieces spreading all over the abdominal cavity. At that point is when I started doing some research and I found out that gynecologists have a device called a power morselator. You take a sarcoma, so you just splatter it all over someone's abdominal cavity. You've basically created a man-made stage four cancer. I had no idea such a device even existed after nine years of surgical training. I mean, the simple question was, well, how many patients are getting this operation done? A colleague of mine from medical school did the analysis, reviewed the literature, and came up with the incidence of occult leiomyosarcoma in women with symptomatic fibroids is on the order of somewhere in the range of 1 in 300 to 350, 400. And if you make an assumption that these tumors are benign, you're going to expose the women who are carrying a cancer to a risk. That assumption was solidified into a standard of practice simply because it was a very lucrative one. You know, each one of these operations is about $30,000. The FDA organized a hearing on the power morselator. Our entire family was present there. I presented, Amy presented. The FDA hearing, what happened was quite remarkable. Dr. Craig Shriver, who was the surgical oncologist on the panel, stood up and basically said that this indeed is a violation of surgical principle and that he would recommend that this product be banned. We put up a very, very big fight to try to save Amy's life and her survival at close to 43 months following her diagnosis was really a testament to her commitment to earning as much meaningful time with our children. But in the end, cancer was spread in her abdomen and it caused her death. Life throws curveballs sometimes. We all have to make the best of it and create meaning out of suffering. That's basically the greatest lesson Amy has taught me.